So our first theme of the day here is what can philosophy tell us about reality that science can't? And Philip, I'm going to bring you in here because you laid out a few possible areas in, in science. Can, can you um, elaborate on that for us? So, I mean, I think if you are a follower of scientism, which is excel, itself a philosophical position, and you think the only things we're permitted to believe in are those that can be experimentally verified, then there's not much of a role for philosophy in uh, finding out about the nature of reality. The trouble is, if you're consistent in your scientism, you won't believe in your own conscious experience because conscious experience is not a postulation of experimental science. The philosopher Daniel Dennett is wonderfully consistent in this, right? He's a zealous believer in scientism. He appreciates that his own conscious experience cannot be experimentally verified, so he doesn't believe in it. So I, th I essentially think there's no middle way between someone like me and someone like Dennett if you're going to be consistent. You either drink the Kool-Aid with Dennett accept scientism, deny the reality of your conscious experience, or you accept that there are non-empirical data, by which I mean information about reality that we know independently of public observation experiments, such as the reality of your own consciousness. As soon as you admit that, then there's a crucial task for philosophy, which is taking the things we know about empirically, the things we know about in these other ways, bringing them together, and it's about time we got back to that very important task. Can you just, can I push you even further yeah. on the consciousness, like w w to clarify, just make it easy for everyone, what, what for you is it that within consciousness that, that science can't get at? Good, so I think, so I say we know about consciousness in this special way by attending to our own experiences, and when we do this, we discover that our experience involves qualities, colours, sounds, smells, tastes, qualities that can't be captured in the purely quantitative vocabulary of physical science. So if your description of the brain is framed in the purely quantitative vocabulary of neuroscience, you just miss out these qualities and hence really miss out consciousness itself. And finally, you know, we shouldn't be surprised about this because our, as I argue in my book Galileo's Error, quick plug, plug that our <laughs> current scientific paradigm for the last 400 years was designed to exclude consciousness. At the start of the scientific revolution, Galileo wants this purely mathematical, quantitative science. He appreciates that the qualities we encounter in conscious experience, colors, sounds, smells, tastes, can't be captured in these terms, so he says, well, if we want a mathematical science, we've got to take the qualities of consciousness out of the picture. That was a good move. It was the start of mathematical physics. But we're now, it's gone so well. We're now at a phase of history where people like Peter say, it's gone so well, it's the truth of everything. The irony is, it's gone so well because it was designed to be a partial description of reality by Galileo, one that excludes the qualitative reality of conscious experience. What a load of yeah. nonsense. Yeah. I, I, I suspected Peter would come in here. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try to quantify that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you want an example of the pessimism of a philosopher, that was the perfect example. <laughs> we will never understand consciousness. Let's focus on never consciousness. Said that. No, no, but let's focus on consciousness because I think there are actually only two serious problems in science that we have not yet solved. One is the origin of everything, which is part of physics and mathematics, and the other is consciousness, the way that our brains generate this property, this property of matter. And we are making progress. We are, bu we are building machines that are edging, not only are we understanding the structure of the brain and beginning to see how bits of the brain in a kind of systems way interact with each other, we are also beginning to build machines that are on the edge of simulating consciousness. And once we have simulated consciousness, we will master other features such as, Julia mentioned, aesthetics. Why? Aesthetics is just a part of consciousness. Once we've mastered consciousness, we shall master aesthetics as well. And we're edging towards doing it. We've got we, we know that we can build machines that can f emulate little bits of consciousness. That's happened over the last 20 years. What's going to happen over the next 200 years? So don't be as pessimistic as you, you were displaying. 
I'm tempted to bring you in here, Julian, because of the aesthetics coming in to mm. play there. Would you have a response to aesthetics discussed sufficiently? Well, in, actually, in the the aesthetics is an interesting one because I've got more sympathy for that than that you, you might have thought. But I mean, b before I sort of like take a position it may not be had, let's, let's clarify about values, let's about moral values and ethical values. Uh, I don't think they're going to build a sort of a large values collider in, in, in Switzerland soon, right? Um, but what, so was, where, do, where, where, where are your values going to sit in this? Because oh. I, mean, I can think of a couple of examples. Is it, is it going to be the case that uh, this is simply going to be a description of the way the human mind works. We're simply going to find that we value certain things because of certain brain processes, blah, 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 and that's all there is to it. Or, or what? Is that it? Yeah, it, it's evolution. I mean, I mean it, in order to understand um, our current morality and views about it, we have to think about our ethological history and the way that our attitudes to other people have evolved in a survivalist sort of scenario. So I don't see, I, I know that science at the moment can't say that this is good and this is bad, but I think to understand it you can use science and you look back over the way that we have emerged from the cave and have come to the current day and, and that illuminates morality. Okay, well that's interesting because you see I think this, this gets to something that's potentially fruitful. It seems to me that uh, the, the scientific kind of view is uh, adopts a kind of a, a highly reductive view in the sense that nothing genuinely, genuinely importantly different can emerge from the more fundamental uh, building blocks of the universe. And the variety is a good example, because if you take somebody who's a little less headbangish about this, like Patricia Churchland, Patricia Churchland is often characterised as being kind of a, a, a sort of a fundamentalist. She isn't. She's very clear. She says that what you understand through neuroscience and everything is the neural platform on which morality sits. And evolution explains how it emerged. But, the, but I think most of us would think that, yes, you can tell that story, that's true. But what has emerged takes on a life of its own. We are not merely slaves to this, because otherwise you would never be able to make a distinction between what we have evolved to judge to be right or wrong and what is actually right or wrong. So if someone could show that we have evolved to, 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 to think like, say, rape is a good thing, right? Because if, if you evolved to approve of rape because it, it, it helps to sort of mix up the gene pool or something, you'd have no argument against that unless you could show that it hadn't evolved. Whereas actually what evolution has done and the new and the brain has done has developed the capacity for us to engage in thoughts which somehow take us to a, another level of organization and complexity so uh, you know things emerge out of the basic physical nature of the world which can't be then reduced back into them and i think that's that's the, the what how i would see it i'm not Ganesh, I mean, yeah. you know do you can you respond to the kind of can't get an awful yeah news, i mean sort of so i thought i agreed with you at the start Jean, and then and then i sort of found myself thinking yeah but we're not trying to reduce it back to that, right? It's, it's science, science is about trying to understand that where that, the, the physical elements of our existence, right? It's not, and consciousness is a difficult one because as, as Philip pointed out, you know, we have it right now, right? We, all of us in this room have a sensation, an understanding of I myself am here and doing this kind of thing. So, you know, that is undeniably a problem. But also, you know, if I said animals aren't conscious, people would have to, I hope at least most of you would disagree with me, right? So there, there, this, this sort of idea that somehow consciousness is something that happens other, that doesn't relate to our physicality, I don't think is completely true. Oh no, um, obviously it's like, it does relate to our physicality, that you, without the physical um, foundations of it, it would not be possible, I'd fine. agree with that. So, but, so then, the, the premise of science is just to, if you understand the foundation that you spoke of. If you understand the foundation, you understand the scope, the playing field within which we are playing, surely that's, that can only be a good thing. No, I don't think anyone's denying the fact that there's you know, relevance to, or the fact that human beings you know, clearly have systems that, that allow them to operate in ways in which aren't completely in keeping with what our biology tells us to do. I mean, else right now I'd just be snacking, you know. Um, is that, that sort of, I mean, I'm not joking about that. Um, <laughs> but you, you see what I'm saying. I'm saying that I, I don't see that the pursuit of science, the belief that uh, the scientific method gives us an accurate representation of our bodies, of ourselves, of the world that we're in, not ourselves, excuse me, our bodies and the world that we are in, 
is it, I don't think it takes away from the pursuit of trying to understand how we feel about that and what does that mean and where does that come from. I, I, I don't see those as mutually exclusive. Well, well I mean, I'm not, okay, we're not sure we're entirely connected because I don't think so either. The question is whether or not that scientific account exhausts all that can be meaningfully said about this. That's the scientism thing. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.